On our interview for today, we will be speaking with a lawyer and activist, Libros Oshoma, on the Constitution Fifth Alteration Bill 2023 and the benefits for states. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's the Watching Politics Tonight, digging beyond the headlines. And now to our interview with the guest of the day. I am joined by a lawyer and human rights activist, Libros Oshoma, on the Constitution Fifth Alteration Bill 2023 and the benefits for states. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. Uh, President Buhari recently assented to some legislations that altered some provisions of the 1999 Constitution. What does this mean for us as a country? Yeah, uh, before I, I answer your question, let me quickly permit me, please, to quickly use this opportunity to wish um, our friend and brother, um, Otitoju, uh, a happy birthday, a, a happy birthday. And then uh, many happy returns, and uh, may the sky be too near to this minute. Thank but you very said, much. I'm sure he's listening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But that said, um, I think um, why we would say that um, we're taking steps gradually to achieve, you know, um, the Nigerian of our dream constitutionally, uh, where powers will be devolved more to the um, federating unit rather than concentration at the center. But it is obvious as it, it is um, a welcome development, even though one would have expected that when you devolve power, also, you know, shed some of the financial weight so that the states, you know, can have you know, the benefit of the trappings of these um, finances to enable them carry out the constitutional responsibilities that have been devolved to them, like um, railway, uh, power and the rest. But I also do not want a situation where the state will be lazy to consistently hang on to this feed the bottle style of uh, government where every day they go to the center to feed a little from the feeding bottle at the center and rush down to, to the federating unit. So now there is nothing holding back the state now from engaging in railway construction you know, even though one state can do that, but we've seen Lagos, you know, doing that, mm -hmm. the, the metro rail, but some persons will say, well, Lagos is different from others. Uh, but yeah, we've seen Lagos done that, but now states can collaborate. The Southwest states, for example, can come together. Nothing now stops them from um, using um, rail to interconnect the, the uh, cities or the state capitals in the Southwest. The Southeast, for example, also, whose, uh, you know, indigenous are very mobile and Republican. Nothing stops the governor from synergizing now to create a central railway system that can run from, you know, Aba to, uh, what do you call it, uh, Umaha, Umaha to Were, Were to Enugu, Enugu to Onicha, and then connect o Onicha back to Were again and all of that. So that will ease transport, that will ease also the movement of goods and services. Nothing now also stops the states from synergizing to generate their own power. And then, you now, like before, the arrangement you have before now, you generate the power and you will have to evacuate to national grid. Now with um, the Fifth Amendment, you generate the power, you don't have to evacuate to national grid. Uh, you right. can generate and uh, sell your, your, your own power within you know, your local environment. Even before, the, the, the railway, you know, state could embark on the same, but it has to be like what Lagos state government is doing. But now, with what is happening now, the state government can also embark on rail without having to, you know, get um, a directive or, or, or grant or, or permission from, from the federal. All right, so uh, this bill is uh, fragmented into 16 bills. What parts do you consider the most uh, critical uh, for the Federation? Uh, yeah, for me, you know, being a developing nation, 
like that's why I told you that the part I consider most, um, you know, critical, you know, the fact, the part that will enhance infrastructural development, talking about power generation, talking about railway construction. Um, like I said, those are, are what I consider most critical. And um, not that others are not critical, but mm -hmm. you will need this, you know, viable ones to drive, you know, economic growth, you to drive um, job creation, to diversify the economy within the state, and then also, you know, to um, attract investors. So that's why those are very critical for me. All right, so 16 bills, but uh, four of those bills are centered on devolution of powers, promotion of true federalism, as well as strengthening of state houses of assembly and the judiciary. For you, is this a way forward for true federalism in Nigeria? Yes, like I said at the beginning, it's a way forward. It is um, a step in the right direction. It is uh, better late than never. It is also... Uh, um, better for us to have it fragmented this way than wait for it to come in one full sweep one day that might never come. Um, we're looking at, um, and also another thing I want to also, you know, crave um, the states to actually do is to ensure that um, this local government autonomy, uh, true autonomy is in, indeed, in words and indeed, granted to the local government because the states are gradually, or if not, not, are taking over the functions of the local government, and uh, that is killing government at the grassroots completely. Well, local government are reduced now to salary paying agencies, and um, you have uh, primary health centers that cannot even boast of primary health care for, for citizens. So, um, let's really, for me, that's you know an area I would want to see the state why they are dragging the federal government for. You know, more devolution. I also want the state to devolve, you know, absolute real power, uh, not absolute power, you know, concedes some level of independence to the local government. Uh, but like I said, there are challenges, there will be financial challenges, but the state, this is the time for them to look, you know, inward, think outside of the box to actually generate revenue outside, you know, the feeding bottles, because you concede responsibilities, you know, but the, you consistently hold on, you know, to the financial muscles. So it is a work, it's a, a step in the right direction. And we just hope that with time, we we'll truly and indeed see the states able to do more and more truly independent in terms of finances. Yeah, so talking about finances, which are least me thinking, with these are 16 constitution alternations. States can now generate and distribute electricity as well as own railway. And like you said before, you mentioned, I'm going to be asking, how viable are the states to do this? Yes, you mentioned Lagos, but of course, many would agree with you that Lagos is different. But what about other states? Yeah, that's why I said for other states, they can create synergies. They can come together. It's not, um, it's not compulsory that um, um, you must do it all by yourself. This idea of um, everybody wanting to have an airport, you know, you have an airport in uh, Lagos, you have an airport in Ibadan, you have an airport in Akure, you have an airport uh, in Ilori and all of those things. Not every, I, I, I traveled to, to Paris. I took a train from Paris to Frankfurt in Germany. I enjoyed the beautiful scenery on the countryside. These are two countries, you know? And if you get to Gaduno uh, um, uh, train station in Paris, it is always, Busy. It is filled to the brim. People are traveling all over Europe. They are connecting trains all over Europe. So this idea of wanting to have airports everywhere, you can also, you can't, you can't move the kind of goods and services you will move with train, with airports, with a plane. You know, you're connecting Lagos and Ibadan. You have Lagos and Ibadan, you're connecting train, a, a, a train service, connecting train from Lagos and Belkuta, just like the Lagos, um, what do you call it, um, the uh, um, uh, railway service you have from Lagos, Abelkuta, and uh, Ibadan. If you have more of that, do you know the number, the volume of goods that coaches can move? Even these fuel tankers that are collapsing on the way and killing people. You really won't need much of these fuel tankers to, to move petroleum products. 
you move them using you, you know the, the train. So the viability of it, apart from the fact that you know the construction is going to create job opportunities for people, there's going to be technology transfer, and also you're going to have a lot of byproduct, byproducts in the sense that agriculture in these places where um, what do you call it um, uh, the interlands where ordinarily people won't go to settle will be viable because you have the means of moving your goods from the interland to the city. There's market already. Just take another look. Just imagine. Just imagine this: that you have a railway service on that Lagos, Moway, Ibafor, Shagam, all the way to Ibadan, and then sometimes to uh, Abelkuta corridor or a Jebode. Imagine the people, the concern, the decentralization that is going to take place in Lagos. You have people now, you can walk in Victoria Island and reside in a Jebode. You take a train in one hour, 30 minutes without having to sit in traffic. You are back to Victoria Island. So you're going to have a lot of the, the uh, housing development in this area will definitely increase geometrically. So all of these, and then you're going to have infrastructure grew up in these places also. So instead of waiting for the federal government to construct railway line, if the states can come together, take loans, long-term loans, okay. and build this infrastructure, power them, and you, the smallest business in Nigeria run on power, pepper grinding, bagging saloon, mm -hmm. tomatoes, uh, and all of those things. You will need storages for this thing. So if the states can come together and generate resources, and be able to provide these, you know, services. You'll be able to, in turn, create jobs, and then tax the people who are who you are creating jobs for. So that means more, more, more revenue from the state. But unfortunately, we don't think outside the box. We're always waiting for that desire to come, bring the money for us. You eat some, and the end of at the end of the day, some of the projects are abandoned. So the the uh, uh, life is moving away from just road and then um, and then um, um, the sky. A lot of a lot of interconnectivity is going on, you know, with um, with railway lines. So I think Nigerians and the state need to key into that. They need to collaborate. Gone are the days where you say you want to do it alone. You can travel from London all the way to Paris, taking train. You don't even have to bother, you know, um, 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 flying. You know, so all of this you also make money apart from the ticketing. You're going to create jobs for people. You're going to, you, you know, open up the interiors. There, there will be no, it will no longer be that concentration of everybody wanting to live at the center in Lagos. There are some persons who would want to live, you know, away because they know they can always get into Lagos at any time. All right, thank you very much. I was going to ask you to expatriate to Synergy because if one of these options is synergizing with the federal government, I was going to say, does this not, you know, take us back to the same cycle we're trying to run away from? But then let's move on. Now, another no. critical... Okay. No, no, quickly. Um, the, the states are equally... They, they, they are on the same pedestal in terms of creating synergy. synergy. Unlike a federal government that is a behemoth, the federal, before now, the federal government, you know, solely has the responsibility of providing rail, rail service. So it is like the state going to beg the federal government for concession for infrastructural development. But now the federal government has concessioned those powers to the state to say, look, you know, you can now do it your, on your own. So the state, if they come together, it's about financing, just like you and I entering into a business venture. You bring in your capital, I bring my own uh, uh, capital well, equity contributions, and if we're going to take a loan to add to it, and then we also agree on the sharing formulas and the, 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 the trajectory of such business. So you have equal partners, four states, two states, three states, depending on what they are bringing on board. And then employment, how are the people from these states going to be employed? Who and who, what's the percentage? 30% from state A, 30% from state B, 30% from state C. And they know how to share power. It is the synergy. So when it comes to infrastructural development, it shouldn't be a problem also because we are not talking about one person, one domineering state or one domineering federal government. We're talking about businesses between partners coming together right. and tra driving a project that one person can't do alone. Thank you very much. Now, um, another critical aspect of the alteration bill is number 45, which 
provides time frame for the submission of the names of ministerial or commissioner nominees. What impact do you think this will have on governance? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, why I didn't think, uh, for me, when you asked me what are the critical areas, I didn't think that was um, uh, too critical for me, is the fact that um, human beings, if you, if you like, I agree and I like the fact that let's have the names of the nominees before, you know, let them be screened, let portfolios be attached to those names so we know we can, well, we can scrutinize them, who is fit for who. But at the end of the day, you find that these people are just admin manager. And if you have a president who is not able to use them effectively, they just end up as paper tigers. So that's why for me, as good as it is, it has nothing to do with uh, devolution of power per se. So it's uh, just an administrative convenience. For, for the government is also, I would also want to look at the situation where this appointment of ministers, one from every state, you know, we, why can't we just have eight ministers, for example? So if you have all of these same 36 ministers from one from each state without portfolios, some ministers for states, junior ministers, and, you know, almost doing the job of a pump set to sit between the senior minister and the permanent secretary, so at the end of this, mere multiplication and duplication of duty, as good as that is, yeah, it is not too critical to the success or failure of a government if you truly put the right uh, the square pegs in square holes. All right. So let's talk about uh, financial independence for state houses of assembly and uh, state judiciary in the country. How is that guaranteed with this uh, fifth alteration bill 2023? For a long time now, we've had um, this idea of, oh, let us charge um, the finances of the judiciary to the consolidated mm -hmm. revenue. Uh, let us have financial autonomy for the state judiciary. This idea of um, the uh, state government gifting judges cars, and then they are being celebrated as if it is from their pocket, shouldn't be there. But financial autonomy is for legislature. But the critical question is, you find out that these legislatures have become like an appendage of, um, of um, the uh, executive at the state level. So whether it is just the finances that will enhance or strengthen their independence, it's one of them, but we need people. Gone are the days where you have you know, people who could look a governor in the face and speak truth to him from the state house of assembly. Now, what you have are the access to come and go. So even the financial independence, I'm taking this on the fact that on the basis of what I, I presume or what I, I determine to be more important, they are all good. All these alteration, like I said, mm. are all beautiful, fantastic. Financial independence for um, the legislature, fantastic. But this independence, the summit, like just at the National Assembly, at the end of the the year you submit your budget proposals and then once it is approved the funds are released to the judiciary or to the um, uh, legislature this idea of having to go cap in hand to the state executive anytime they need money begging them for projects shouldn't be there it right. is also it strengthens democracy it strengthens independence it is also you know very good but also you should have you already have a system in place where there are oversight and how, long, how these finances are spent. Once that is fully implemented and followed through, the idea of governors having All to right. hold uh, judges by the ball to determine what they would do for them will no longer be there. All right, Mr. Libros, just before we go, now with this effort by the Ninth National Assembly, what other legacy legislations will you want the next legislation to focus on? Yeah, there are very, very critical areas. We are still talking about... Um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, fiscal federalism, for me, it is key. Now, they've considered, the federal government has considered some power. The next legislature will need to also dig more from the federal government. I still do not think that the federal government should be dealing with education. What's the business of the federal government with the federal government college of education, for example? You know, the federal government shouldn't just be solely responsible for education, even at the state level. That's one part that they also need to concede. Also, majorly, 
this idea of the federal government consistently holding on to, you know, revenue. Look at what happened with gold in Zampara. You know, why can't we also extend that to, to oil, to a very large extent, let the, oil, the state government be able to prospect oil in their region at their own free will, just like you see people prospecting for gold in Zampara. At the end of the day, pay a percentage to the center. That will enhance, you know, government to take their mind away from the feeding bottle arrangement and begin to seek or source for the natural resources in their domain, knowing fully well that those natural resources will be used solely for them, and then they only have to pay the taxes to the center. That's another critical area I would want the Tenth Assembly to, to focus their mind on, right. and that will help competitiveness at the state level. All right. I really wish we had enough time to analyze this further, but sadly we're out of time. But I must thank you, Mr. Libros Oshoma, uh, a lawyer and human rights activist. Thank you very much for your detailed analysis on our discussion tonight. Constitution Bill 2023 and the benefits for state. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, Ollie.